Thank you, Brenda. That was beautiful. He is here. Hallelujah. I need to be reminded of that sometimes, don't you? And they weren't talking about me. I'm here, but that's not who they're talking about. They're talking about Jesus, obviously. He's here, and he's with us. Anytime we gather in his name, he's with us. And, uh, and then, Jack, I couldn't have handpicked a better uh, song for you to play than the old Rugged Cross. One of the first hymns I ever learned and has had such profound effect and meaning on my life. I would invite you to share with me the scriptures, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. We'll begin reading with the 18th verse. I'll tell you what, I'll back it up one verse. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I had a uh, homiletics professor in seminary that said, we sometimes get that confused, fellas. He said, God saves men by the foolishness of preaching, not foolish preaching. <laughs> sometimes I've been guilty maybe of both. I uh, feel led as we approach Easter to think in terms of four weeks, these next four Sundays before Easter, about the cross. You know, so often when we get into the liturgy of the Holy Week and everything like that, we try to cover various points, and, and then we really find ourselves not having time to preach about the cross. Well, I want to remedy that, hopefully, for the next four Sundays. You'll be pleased to know that I did have decided to extend it over the next four Sundays and not try to give it all to you today. This Sunday, I want to talk about the meaning of the cross. Next Sunday, the message of the cross. And then March 18th, the might of the cross. And then on March the 25th, the ministry of the cross. So as we engage in this study, let us concentrate this morning on the meaning of the cross. What does it mean to us today, to those in the world today? And then what has it meant to those in past days, and what will be its place in the future? You know, but most importantly, what does the cross mean to you and to me? You know, if you notice in verse 18, Paul writes that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who disregard it and don't understand it. But the might of the cross is the power of God to those who are being saved. 
Now, I'm so grateful that Paul writes in the third person when he's talking to those who are perishing because he said, but to those who are perishing, it is foolishness. But then he writes in the first person and he says, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So I have a simple question for you this morning as we uh, embrace the cross are you being saved? You know, salvation is a term we often use in a past tense, like I was saved or I have been saved. Uh, the actual terminology is that we are being saved. We're being saved every day. And uh, I'll go into that in detail maybe at some other time, but just the question, are you being saved? I've heard people say, how do you know that you're saved? Well, I'm, one of the th ways that I want to say that you can know is that the cross is much in your life. Do you cherish the cross or do you condone the cross? Let's, let's explore that thought for just a little this morning. Do you lift high the cross in your theology? Is it central to your devotion to Christ? Do you speak of its power to your friends and your family? Do you seek to better understand its mystery through study? Does the mere mention of the cross thrill your heart? Do you meditate upon the cross daily? You know, the church is being silenced by those who wish to suppress our message. And one of the things that they definitely want to suppress is the message of the cross. So with these thoughts in mind, I want us to think about the cross this morning and the meaning of the cross. But I want us to also uh, recognize with this qualifier that we will never understand perfectly the full meaning of the cross. And so our endeavor this morning is not to understand perfectly the cross, but to merely come to touch the cross in amazement and in awe, like a child playing in the edge of the ocean where the waves are lapping up around their feet and they're dancing in the wet sand. That is basically what we'll probably have today by the time we go home. We dare not assume that we know all there is to know about the ocean merely by playing in the water's edge. And as Christians, we can sometimes be guilty of this behavior of saying, well, we know all about the cross. We hear it preached all the time. Crosses are everywhere, so we know all about the cross. And so therefore, familiarity someone sometimes breeds contempt, or at least ignorance or apathy. But who would be so arrogant as to say, well, I know everything there is to know about the cross? <coughs> would our behavior say otherwise? If you see, we put down our Bibles and we let them gather dust, then we have basically said, we understand all there is to know about the cross because the only authoritative written word about the cross is in Scripture. And so if we truly have a love for the cross and we truly want to embrace the cross, we will love God's word and we will read it more. Or if we're like the Christian that prays infrequently and usually when they're in trouble, we're missing the wonderful, blessed assistance of the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to us and to reveal his passion that put him on the cross. Or if we become the Christian who stops worshiping with other believers, we neglect the assembly of the church, we are missing out on the witness of the cross in the lives of our brothers and sisters of the faith and the joy of worshiping together in the shadow of the glorious cross. So let us not be foolish about the cross like those who are perishing or who disregard its purpose and discredit its power. Or else we will be as foolish as a toddler going on the lecture circuit about the ocean because he understands all about the ocean because he has played 
in the water's edge. So our first point I'd like to make this morning in understanding the meaning of the cross is that we are seeking to understand that meaning. We're not going to ever embrace it perfectly or understand it perfectly. So let's look for that meaning in the cross as we look around us. Just think about it. Look around you in this world. There are crosses everywhere, are there not? Crosses on jewelry, crosses on, on steeples around and uh, all over the, the county, all over America, all over the world. In fact, I saw a cartoon the other day that kind of uh, struck to the heart. It was more convicting than it was comical. It was the picture of a crude outline of a church, and there was a cross on top. And then in the next panel, there was a crane, and the crane was coming up to the church, and, and the crane, uh, it was extended and was lifting the cross off. And then, then you see the church without the cross, and then in the next panel, you see the crane putting up a question mark in its place. And I wonder if that was a, an indictment on the church to say, do we understand the meaning of the cross? Do we understand the purpose of the cross? Or does it merely just adorn our buildings? The cross is not just something that goes on a building or goes on jewelry around the neck. It has come to be the logo, a symbol of Christianity, hasn't it? You know, we uh, disagree about how the cross should look, though. The Catholics think Jesus should still be on the cross. They call that a crucifix. And then uh, Protestants primarily have a barren cross or just a, a plain cross. But really, it's the same cross. We're just trying to understand it, trying to appreciate it, maybe in a, as an art form. But the cross is the unifying mark of Christianity. You see, there is no Christianity without the cross. And whatever one chooses, and if you want to do a study sometimes, just Google the cross and look at all the different pictures you'll see. You'll see everything from a Latin cross to a Greek cross to the St. Andrew cross to a St. Thomas cross. There's just crosses everywhere. But it is the symbol of our faith. Well, not only is it a unifying mark of Christianity, it is a dividing point that separates Christianity from the rest of the world. Uh, my niece's husband is a University of Florida fan. And to put that in perspective, he says, you're either gator or you're gator bait. <laughs> and in essence, that's what the cross says. You either embrace the cross or you reject the cross. Uh, the, even the red cross is the red crescent in the Middle East because they reject the cross. They do not want to have the cross as a symbol of humanitarianism. Now, many Christians around the world make the sign of the cross. They, they make the sign of the cross. I, I heard, uh, and, and uh, you've seen people make the sign of the cross. Sometimes when I pray, I want to cross myself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, I bless you sometimes in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, it is a wonderful way of acknowledging that we are under the cross. Now, so we've looked briefly back for just a moment. Uh, I mean, looked around us for just a moment. Now let's look back briefly to the cross. Where did the cross emerge as being the symbol of the church? It may surprise you to know that in the catacombs of Rome, the earliest examples of Christian art, the cross is not very prominent. In fact, you don't even see it very much. You know the most prominent thing you see? You see the fish. You see the ichthus. I know probably some of y'all have seen these before. 
but uh, you know you make a fish like this with a little arc and then like that you connect it and that makes the sign of the fish well this was the sign that was used during days of persecution in the first couple of centuries in Christianity because you could walk up to somebody and you could have your staff and you could just make that little half loop and uh, and then if the person was not a Christian, they'd just look at you. But if they were a Christian, they would join it together and it would make a little fish. And uh, it was ways that brothers and sisters met in times of persecution. Now that uh, was not just the symbol that someone picked because the word ichthus, like we hear ichthyology, the study of fish, the word ichthus is an acrostic of the five words Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior. Iesus, Jesus, is the first letter, and then Iota, Chi, Theta, Upsilon, Sigma is the beginning of the words Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior. And so the ichthus became the symbol. Well, about the third or fourth century, the cross took its place. Something wonderful happened. A fellow by the name of Constantine was vying for the throne of the Roman Empire. And the rivals that were fighting him placed him into a very precarious position. And he, before that battle, on October the 27th of 312 A.D., saw a vision. He saw the vision, some have said the vision of the cross, but he saw the vision of the Cairo. Have you ever seen what looks like a giant P with an X through it like that? That is, the X is the Chi, and the P is the Rho. It's not really a P, it's pronounced R in Greek. It's the Rho. And it was the Cairo. It's the first two letters in the word Christ. And not only did he see that vision, and he wasn't a Christian, he saw the words under this sign conquer. So he immediately ordered for the, all of his legions to take their standard or their labyrinth and to place a Cairo on top of it and to take all of their shields and to paint the Cairo on, on them. And he went into battle. And as history tells us, he won the battle and became the sole emperor of the Roman Empire. It was during this time that Christianity emerged from the persecution that they had experienced under Diocletian all the way up to 312. And when Constantine became the emperor, he immediately granted what is called the Edict of Milan, which is an edict that granted to the Christians they would no longer be persecuted, but their faith would be tolerated. Now, he did not become a Christian immediately. But it was 70 years later before Christianity became the sovereign religion of the Roman Empire. But it was in that experience that then the cross emerges as the central focus of our faith. And the fish is replaced with the cross. But only rightly so, my brothers and sisters, because the cross is the center of our faith. And without the cross, there is no Christianity. It was so prominent that during the Middle Ages, uh, the knights who went uh, on crusade into the Middle East had the cross on everything. You can look at some of the artwork and you'll see that bright white standard with the bright red cross. They uh, carried their crosses everywhere on their flags and on their banners and on their armor. But that also had a second effect. Not only did it cause Europe to maybe embrace the cross, but it caused the rest of the world to despise the cross because it was under that sign that they were marching and under that sign that they were doing war. 
with the various other nations. But we've looked around us and we've seen the meaning of the cross and we've looked backward for just a moment, just a brief sketch of history. So now let's look briefly into the future and see if the cross has meaning for the future. You know, Jesus told the thief on uh, his right hand when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, today you'll be in, with me in paradise. So the cross, I believe, has a future. The cross has tremendous meaning today because we are learning that it is our hope for our eternal home. The cross is so vital to Christianity that it cannot be neglected or ignored. It is central to our worship. So much so that St. Paul wrote that he had determined to know nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let me quote some of his writings just briefly. Paul wrote in Galatians 6, 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. Or as he wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, For I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Or, as he wrote in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And yet not I, but Christ lives within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, you know, after all this looking around and looking back, my head's kind of spinning a bit, and I still feel like there's no way that we understand the meaning of the cross completely. And as I told you in my disclaimer at the beginning, we were only going to simply touch upon the edge. We were only going to just simply find ourselves engaged in some bit of mental study, but more importantly, just by talking about the cross, we are going to remind ourselves of its beauty and embrace it maybe with a renewed appreciation. The cross is central in the teaching of the Word of God, and the cross is central in sacrament. It is through word and sacrament that we embrace the cross. As we preach the word of God, as we lift high the cross, then Jesus draws all men unto himself. And we lift high the cross in our words this morning as we share together the word of God and as we share together the sacrament of our Lord. I invite you to join uh, with us as we celebrate this sacrament. Uh, we will rejoice together. And, uh, and I want you to know that you don't have to be a member of this church because this is not a church table. This is the Lord's table. And if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are certainly invited to come to the table. I would challenge you to remember that we are to cherish the old rugged cross. And every time we take a sip of this blessed beverage or take a, a, a bite or a taste of this glorious bread, we do show forth the Lord's death till he comes.